Hey, it's Bill, and you're tuned into the Pennsylvania Rock Show, featuring the best unsigned rock and metal that Pennsylvania has to offer right here on parockshow.com, megarockradio.net, 107.1 FM, St. Louis, Missouri, altrockradio.ca in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, across the pond at xrpradio.co.uk in Birmingham, United Kingdom, and then on the west coast of the United States, on ruderoo.radio.com and right here on our home station, buildthescene.com. This is episode number 546 of the Pennsylvania Rock Show. With me tonight is Robert Wagner. Yeah, I messed that up. Wagner, do you know that name? <laughs> I do. I do. Tectonic plates. That's right. Let me try that again. Robert Wagner of the Little Wretches. Wretch- I can't speak tonight. The Little Wretches. I'm going to start that over. With us tonight is Robert Wagner of the Little Wretches. Um, those of you from the Pittsburgh area probably recognize that name from the 80s and the 90s. Um, and if you've been paying attention in 2020, you might recognize it again. <laughs> What's up, Robert? Yeah. Oh, man, thank you for having me. Yeah, I hope he, people who are around the day start to recognize the name again. Uh, you're trying hard trying hard to get our names on the landscape, you know. I, I hope in about three years when people start looking at, like, you know, American songwriters and they look at Steve Earle and they, you know, look at Marshall Crenshaw or something like that, they say, oh, there's that guy from Pittsburgh, Wagner. He's really good, too, you know. Just want to be in the game. <laughs> so I, um, like a lot of my guests, found out about you from Michael Stover um, of MTS Management. Um and he lives maybe th- five miles from me, and I've never met him. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, <laughs> that's amazing how how it's it, you know it's it, it could be like that anywhere. I, when I was much younger, I had some friends in uh, who were living in the Homestead area, and they were originally from San Francisco. And I bumped into them down on Fifth Avenue in downtown Pittsburgh, and it freaked them out. They're like, Pittsburgh is so small. We have never in our lives had a chance meeting with somebody we knew in San Francisco. It happens all the time in Pittsburgh. So, yeah, well, the flip side is you could live, you know, five minutes from somebody and never come across them. That's true. <laughs> and depending on what year it was, you could be two inches from them and not see them because of all the smog. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Well, that was, uh, I've heard about those days. I don't actually remember them, though. <laughs> um, so you said that you listened to a few episodes. So I, 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 I love catching guests off guard with some of my questions. We'll see if I can find one that you didn't hear. <laughs> okay. Um, let's let's start to get to know you a little bit as as a musician um if you're scaring me <laughs> you, you told me you told me to be be on my toes you know this is not that you won't hear the typical questions and now now it's like oh no what's he gonna hit me with <laughs> uh, i'm gonna start off with the dave Grohl question i've been trying to get dave Grohl on the show but he keeps ignoring me <laughs> i even emailed the, the foo fighters management team and they didn't even respond <laughs> but uh-huh. Um, the question is, if you've ever watched the Foo Fighter video on YouTube, uh, not the official videos, but the ones from concerts, usually they are, a, you'll see someone holding a sign up saying, I want to come play guitar, or I want to play um, hero, I want to play drums, whatever. Um, and he'll make a big deal out of it, and he'll bring the person up on stage and say, you better not suck, and then they usually don't. <laughs> but yeah. but the, my question is, if you were in that situation, you were out in a crowd and you were holding the sign up, who's your Dave Grohl? So what band is on that stage that you want to join? See, you know, I, I heard you ask that question to other people. I don't want to join anybody's band, you know. Uh, the, the, the whole thing that I do, uh, I mean, I started this band because I don't fit in with anybody. You know, I I built this band around my thing. Uh, You know, I'm not that good. You know, I I can play uh, a little bit. But look, if you're going to go go for it, if there was a band, uh, geez, I I, my favorite bands, if if, but they're all dead now, man. All all my favorite (laughs) bands are dead. I was like, oh, I would have loved to jumped up with the New York Dolls or Johnny Thunders and the Heartbreakers, uh, Walter Lure and the Waldos, the Patti Smith group, 
you know, I, I could probably still hang with the Patty Smith group because she's doing more acoustic -y stuff and, and there was still pretty free form and exploratory. Uh, none of them need me, you know, if, if I, but, but if I could have bragging rights to say Ray Davies called me up on stage or Pete Townsend called me up on stage, somebody like, you know, but I couldn't hang with those guys. They wouldn't need me. They're so good on their own. What, what, what could I possibly bring? You know. Well, along the those lines, let's say you're out on tour, and and I'm tagging along with you. Um, what would the soundtrack be in between shows? So, what would we listen to on the tour bus? Oh man, well that you know that that would depend. That that depends because I you know I have pretty pretty broad taste, and it depends if I'm getting ready to do an acoustic show or, or what. Like, like today, last couple of days, out of the blue. I started listening to uh, the album Brain Salad Surgery from Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. And I'm thinking, wow, if Keith Emerson was a guitar player, he'd have an awful lot in common with Pete Townsend, you know. Uh, and I've been listening to that. They just did the, the reissue of uh, Lola versus Power Man and the Money Go Round, you know, the 2020 mixes. And so I got that, you know, that just became down I pre-ordered it and became downloadable on December 11th so uh I, I listen see I'm the kind of guy I, I have a really hard time appreciating new releases because I'm jaded I've heard, listened to so much music I translate all of my new experiences through my previous experiences so like it was to show my age it was hard for me to appreciate nirvana because when i heard nirvana i was like look man i heard iggy and the stooges what's this so the guy can sing he's got a good alice cooper ty type scream i get it i like his voice but i don't see what he's bringing to the table i've heard this before now in retrospect i can look at nirvana's catalog and see oh, okay they they were loved for a reason but i generally d discover an artist and then listen to everything they ever put out and you know, I have some pretty cool playlists on my phone. I have, you know, one called, uh, are you feeling lucky punk? Well, are you, you know, and it's all, it's all my favorite, like New York underground punk stuff and London, 1977, London stuff. Uh, you know, and I, I spend an awful lot of time studying, uh, artists with a huge body of work, like as singer songwriters, uh, Steve Earle, John Prine, you know, guys like that. Uh, J Jonathan Richmond. I don't know if you're into Jonathan Richmond and the Modern Lovers. You know, just s spans the the spectrum of possible styles, but they have this thing. Or Neil Young. Neil Young's another one that he has a thing. It doesn't matter whether he's playing piano or playing acoustic guitar or playing with Crazy Horse. He's got this thing. Neil Neil is always there. Uh, so that's that's kind of some of the stuff. And of course, Patty Smith, man, Patty. You know. That Patty Smith group. She's 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 the rock poet. Uh, speaking of playlists, um, First Angel Media, which is a um, Pittsburgh-based um, music media company that I happen to be vice president of, um, one of our writers and slash photographers wrote an article this week about um, he was looking at an advent calendar and it got him thinking, and um, he ended up making a playlist on Spotify of songs that meant something to him. So like he did a little um, thinking back on his life and linking events with songs. And um, after I read the article, I did the same thing. I was like, that's really cool. I have to do that. And then when I got done, I had, I had bands like um, Johnny Horton. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. That that's what I expect when people see that one, <laughs> Johnny Horton, Garth Brooks. Um, uh trying to think of some of the eclectic ones that I threw in there. Well, eclectic for a rock guy. Um, wow. Um, and a God of Vita by iron butterflies on the list. Oh, yeah. Yeah, wow. <laughs> um, well, but yeah, so my yeah. question is, are there some songs that you link to, to things that happen in your life that you'd be willing to share with us? Um, Geez, uh, I have I have some pretty dark moments in my life, you know. So that's uh, and and I can say that, you know, look, I'm a kind of a religious person, but you know, no, no religious people ever bailed me out of trouble. 
right? You know, there've been times when my family wasn't there. There've been times when my friends weren't there. There've been times when nobody was there, but I always had music and I always had my guitar and I always had writing, you know? So I, you know, I could say with, you hear that Velvet Underground song, her life was saved by rock and roll. My life was saved by rock and roll. If not for rock and roll, there's no way I, I would be still be here. And, uh, and there's a lot of songs that are like, you know, soundtrack of, of my life type songs. Uh, it, geez. Uh, you know, I could, I could, tell my autobiography for through <laughs> through songs uh but i i can i tell you one particular anecdote though yeah you do you know what cut out albums are i do not okay uh back when people mainly listened to vinyl records uh records that didn't sell uh in the warehouse they would take a little snip out of the cover out of the jacket and they would convince record sellers to buy them for like, you know, five cents a copy. And then they would throw in some good stuff too. They'd throw in some, some hits so that uh, when people went to record stores and they'd flip through what was called the cutout bin, they would look through that stuff because you never know what you would find. Uh, so, you know, I just hated everybody and everything. I went to Bethel Park High School, which back then was within walking distance of South Hills Village Mall. Uh, and I just remember, you know, there, and back when I was there, there's like a thousand kids per, per class. So there might have been 5,000 kids on our campus. So I just left and I went over to the mall and they had a Woolworths, you know, like a, you know, a discount department store that had a, a record section. And they had uh, an album called Tyran Unicorn by Tyrannosaurus Rex, which is T-Rex while they were still acoustic and the Who Sell Out by The Who. And I'd never heard either one, but I, I knew who the who was and I knew who T-Rex was. So I bought those albums for like 99 cents a piece with, you know, because I, I never bought my lunch. I always kept my lunch money in my pocket. And so I had enough money to buy those two albums. And uh, at the time I was living with my grandmother and uh, I remember taking those albums and, and she saw them sitting on her dining room table. She looks one, takes one look at Mark Boland. She says, Ooh, hairless Joe. Cause you know, Mark Boland, the T-Rex has these beautiful, beautiful curl, curly hair. And uh, I, I just remember from that point forward, this is it, you know, music. Sc forget everybody. You can all, you know, you can all, Go wherever you're going to go. Music is what I'm going to tune into. This is what's going to get me through. Uh, so, you know, I've, uh, and then, then weird, weird songs too. Uh, uh, you know, you, you just named some odd things like Johnny Horton. I, I imagine when you're talking about Hort, Johnny Horton, you're talking about like the battle of new Orleans, that, that song in particular, yep. you know, he has a couple and, uh, others. 18 more of 1812 i think the other one, the other one yeah 1814 you took a little uh, yep. trip yeah, yeah that's about uh, battle of new orleans he, he also has north to alaska yep which, I, I recognize know. that name my dad um, my dad had a cassette and he would play it in the car when we would go anywhere and that's one of the one of the albums that that i equate to him that's why it made the list yeah. <laughs> well, well when i was uh you know like the first band i was in was part of the, like the early punk scene in Pittsburgh, which, which as it turns out, wasn't that big of a scene and mainly involved kids from CMU and uh, University of Pittsburgh. And there were a couple of hangouts and a couple of houses, but it, is, it eventually kind of revolved around the electric banana. And, uh, and then from like the, whatever it was that I was doing, the band I was in was called No Shelter. And then we went really deep into like uh, experimental jazz, you know, like improvisational stuff. And, you know, we took it seriously. Uh, that band was called ICU, Intensive Care Unit. I was like, okay, it's, it's, it dishonors Pharaoh Sanders uh, and John Coltrane, who've spent their lives mastering improvisational jazz music for me to go out and squeak on a clarinet. What, what is it that can I, I can really do? I was like, okay, I can write songs. I can write. So I need to take songwriting seriously. I remember going to Garbage Records, Jerry, Jerry's Records, when they were still in Oakland, up, you know, going upstairs and thinking, okay, I need to learn the art of the song. And one song that I found on like multiple albums, a song called How Insensitive. It's got this Bra Brazilian kind of chord change. 
And I ended up with a version by Tony Bennett and a version by Petula Clark. And that's the kind of stuff I was looking for is like uh, pop songwriters, you know, no, no, pop singers that were doing great songs. And I wanted to study the songs. Like, why did they pick this song? What is this song doing? You know, learning the art, learning the form. Uh, Now, there's nothing in my catalog that's going to sound Brazilian or sound like how insensitive, but, uh, but that's a song that, you know, when I want to turn somebody on and say, you know, if, if you're serious about music, you need to broaden your horizons. The stuff you grew up listening to is not enough. Uh, you know, you got to take this seriously. Uh, I mean, and to me, I take it seriously, man. To, to, Lou, I take Lou Reed as seriously as I take Shakespeare, you know, Patti Smith. I take her as seriously as, you know, Name it, Emily Dickinson. You know, that's uh, I, here, here's Walt Whitman. A, put him up there against uh, David Johansson. Anybody, you know, that's I love this stuff. Here, here's another eclectic song that made my list: um, "The Twist," but not by Chubby Checker, by the Fat oh, Boys. <laughs> really? Yeah. Wow, I've and, never heard that. Um, are you familiar with the Fat Boys? Oh, I, absolutely. Okay. I mean, I, you know, you can, might tell by looking at me, I'm kind of old. I remember when the Fat Boys came out and when people first started imitating them, you know, when kids would first start doing the human beatbox. But I never heard the Fat Boys do the twist. Yeah, it, it features Chubby Checker. He's on it. But it, wow, um, it was they had, did a movie called The Disorderlies um, and the Fat Boys are the main characters. And um, when I was in elementary school, I went to a birthday sleepover and we watched that movie. And that's how that one made the list because I had such a great wow. time at that, at that party. Um, yeah. Oh, that's so, so cool. And uh, of oh. course, Johnny Cash is on there, but I didn't do, you know, you could, there's so many Johnny Cash songs that, that, that you could put on a list, but um, yeah. I did hurt, which was a cover because I also like the original version. So I was able to combine two of them together. So I really, yeah. really did some thinking on that. So I'm going to, as a challenge, I'm going to put that out to anybody who's listening, try making a Spotify list. That's the story of you. And uh, you guys can blame Craig Ferry for putting that into my head. It's a great article and an awesome idea. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's, let me see how we're doing time wise. Let's, let's do this. So we're going to play your song. All of my friends tonight. What can you tell me about that song? You can tell me a story about recording it. You can tell me what it's about. You can tell me um, what 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 popped into your head and got you to write it. What whatever you want to tell me. It's kind of like MTV storytellers. Okay. Well, yeah. So it's, it's, it's hard. I'm saying this with a smile, but this is going to sound pretty dark. I think. Uh, you know, a lot a lot of my real friends. Uh, I've had a lot of a lot of members of the little wretches or, you know, in heaven or in their graves, you know, and uh, a lot of my, a lot of people that I grew up with are, uh, you know, suffer from mental illness. You know, I've, so I've, and, you know, and I, and I work with at risk kids. So, you know, I'm around some pretty dark stuff. Uh, when I was in college, I had cancer and uh, I had an economics professor, a Marxist economics professor who visited me in my hospital room every single day. I guess his office building was between his office building and his home. I was in Montefiore hospital. He would stop off and visit me every day. It's, you know, so he would really like an uncle to me. His name was Dave Houston. And you know, he was a Marxist. And at one point he told me that he had sent away for his FBI file long time earlier and it finally came he, you know through the freedom of information act he got his fbi file and he said that there were things in there like dinner conversations that he'd had while he was at restaurants and it creeped him out because it's like what were, were they bugging his table or was somebody he having dinner with uh an fbi you know, agent <laughs> yeah so so that's so that's where the line all of my friends are on somebody's list of undesirables and anarchists i mean i know people who've done some pretty pretty crazy things and very few people know how crazy they were but but you know i know about it like wow we're the luckiest people on earth if if there was actually justice in the world imagine how much trouble we would be in (laughs) uh so that like there's a line in there about uh lesbian couples and their turkey basters you know like you know I, i have 
friends who way before it was cool, you know, were having, you know, same sex couples that were finding ways to have children. And, uh, like all of my friends are on somebody's list of undesirables and anarchists. It's not even safe to admit that you're one of my friends. Uh, if you're going to hell, why not go to extremes? Uh, <laughs> so it's just a collage of one liners and couplets about real people who I love very much, who've never fit into anything. Um, but so, never give up. So it's almost like a, an, um, montage of your friendships over the years. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and I, I, those who are still alive, I hope they hear themselves in there and don't feel offended. Uh, and uh, if there's a heaven, and I, I believe there is, I hope those that are up there smile every time they hear the song. So I hope there's, you know, if you're going to play it right now, I hope there's some smiles up in heaven. All right, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to take a moment and play All of My Friends. By, are, are you going by your name or are you still going by Little Wretches? Well, m most of the gigs I play are solo, so I, I, I try to keep my name out there as much as possible. So, and and there's so many Robert Wagners. I'm going by Robert Andrew Wagner and the Little Wretches. Uh, so when I play a solo gig, which is most mostly what I play, it's Robert Andrew Wagner and the Little Wretches. When the real band is there, and I'm getting away with no Robert Andrew Wagner stuff, because <laughs> everybody else in the band, they can, you know, I could I could play second fiddle to them, you know. But I'm the one who's out here making it happen, you know? So um, what we're going to do, we're going to take a moment and listen to the song. And uh, those of you who are tuned in live with us right now, you're not going to get to hear the song right now. But if you return to parockshow.com starting at 6 a.m. on Friday, it'll be available on the podcast page. And all the, sh all the streaming and FM station that I mentioned at the beginning of the show, we'll, we'll have it playing throughout the week. Um, and you can find the times for those at parockshow.com. So what I'm going to do real quick is I'm going to change my background and then we'll, we'll continue on with the second segment. Cool. Oh, there how, we go. how about that one? <laughs> That's good. That's good. I love the smiles on everybody. I remember when they took it, I wasn't too impressed, but uh, <laughs> I really love that picture now. So which, which version of the band is that behind me? I noticed that you that's, had, that's the version that recorded uh, the albums called undesirables and anarchists and the song, all of my friends that those are the guys right there. Uh, you know, you, you, do you want to name some names? Yeah, are we live here? Am I talking to the to the world? Okay, the guy on the on my left on, uh, that would be your right. That's Mike Madden, the drummer, and uh, you know a lot of your listeners probably don't remember the club, the decade, but it was a legendary rock club in Pittsburgh. Bruce Springsteen played there, you know, U two played there, and the Little Wretches played there. And when Mike Ma when we finished a set with Mike Madden, the sound man, who had heard everybody said where'd you get that guy he's the best drummer that's come through here in months like oh well he's from mcmurray area peters township he went to bethel park high school that's the mike madden that's that's who plays as good as max weinberg and then next to him the woman with the big laugh in progress that's rosa colucci she also she writes i think part-time still for the pittsburgh post gazette if she was only good at one thing she would be known by every person i mean she would be super world famous uh she has an incredible voice and uh, just a natural knack for harmony and percussion uh you know when when i hired her when i auditioned her i told her your job is to make me sound better you know i can play guitar i can write i can sing a little bit i can write your job is to make me sound like i can sing and she just brings a fire to the stage John Carson, uh, next to her, he's the bass player. And uh, the guy who's, there you go, you move the mic, and that's H.K. Hilner. He was the piano player. H.K. Hilner loves two things, the Rolling Stones and Gustav Mahler. You know, uh, He's the one who insisted that this band, the, the Little Wretches were virtually kaput at that point. And it was H.K. 
who heard Rosa and I performing together acoustically, he says, oh, no, 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 no. We're the little wretches. I want to play piano with Rosa. We're going to do your songs, you know, and we're going to be the little wretches again. And then John Carson, uh, who's, you know, I mentioned was the bass player. He's also, he teaches art, I believe, for the Pittsburgh public schools. Uh, and, and these guys, I, I don't even know if you're interested in this. But this album, Undesirables and Anarchists, we went into Dave Granati's studio and we recorded this thing live, we, you know, knowing, I mean, I have a lot of experience in the studio. We're going to overdub vocals. I'm going to double all the guitars, right? But his thing was, if you guys can know the songs well enough to track them without headphones, just set up like it's a live show. By the time you're done setting up, I'll be ready to record. And we, we were playing these songs live we were practicing, you know, so we went into this session knowing Rosa even, I think she recorded percussion in the control room with Dave Granati so that she could give him, you know, that was good enough. You know, I don't know exactly what they talked about, maybe tomatoes and Italian cooking for all I know. <laughs> but, you know, we finished the first song. We look at each other's like, you know, because what you do is if you make a mistake, you punch in your mistake or you say that track wasn't hot enough. Let's let's cut it again. Every song on this album was a first take, punched in nothing. Nobody does that. And if you listen to it, you're not going to hear like, oh, they should have done another take on that. Every, I mean, I wouldn't change a note. And then, of course, then we went back, doubled the guitars, added the vocals and all of that. But the basic rhythm of the band, all of those tracks, that's the way the Beatles did it. That's the way they did it in the old days. You know, you step up in front of the mic, you knock your thing out. And those guys did it. And you you don't know who they are, but show me another band that is capable of doing that. Those guys could do it. So I love those guys. I, I just flash back to watching the show Sun Records where they um, – I'm trying to think who all was portrayed in it. Elvis definitely was. Um, but it, it was that. They went in they, and they did a bunch of one-off recordings. And yeah. you know, Sun Records is legendary in, in the music industry, but yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that's the thing because because I'm uh, I'd already by the time we cut this, that's like you know our tenth album, so I, I know my way around the studio a little bit. I know how I work. We, off be, prior to the show, we were talking about our familiarity with children who have ADHD. I think I have a twinge of that. I don't have the patience to be in there taking recuts or to be you know one of the things they do in studios now they copy and paste you'll like do six vocal takes and then you'll take well this line has a lot of personality and that line has a lot of personality and we'll paste them all together like it's one track i don't have the patience for that and and for that matter i'm not that good of a now rosa is a good of a sing so good of a singer that she could do 30 takes and strive for perfection me one or two takes that's that's as good as you're I'm going to be in the ballpark and that's it. <laughs> uh, but if you get the band hot and the, you know, if, and the, the, the hotness of the band that really is going to revolve around the drummer and the bass player, uh, you know, and, and just the energy like HK, who's just insane on the piano, uh, you know, and it's not a prominent, if you listen to the recording, it's, the piano is going to be underneath the, the guitar a lot, but the energy that they bring, uh, that's, that's the way for me to record, uh, you know, we, we could do a whole session and it'd be a waste. Say, okay, we just we just wasted three hours in the studio. None of that stuff is any good. But this, bang, you know, I, what, maybe for, we, we might have been there three hours, you know, to, to, to record the basic tracks. Nobody does that. I am. Um, on the last episode, um, Eric Roger and Bobby C from the band of Royal Honey, Royal Honey was were on. And um, they're working on a project that um, Dave Granati actually, the Granati brothers actually played a little bit on or sang on. Um, it has to do with Save Our Stages. And I, I don't want to give too much away, but um, you, I figured I'd mention it here since you brought brought up his yeah. Granati mm -hmm. studio. Um, in fact, the nine o'clock meeting that I have after this is is with that group of people. Wow. Wow. So, yeah. Um. So if with 10 albums, this might be a tough question for you and not too far fetched. Um, there, let's say there's a, 
um, apocalyptic event that happens on earth and wipes out most of, of the human race. And there's a handful of people that survive and only one song from every band survives this event. Which of your songs should survive and, and help with the repopulation of earth? No, well, the, the the song that pretty much defined the band, uh, you know, I mentioned that I was in something called No Shelter before, the, and this came together. Uh, you know, my my song, like my theme song, would be the song Born With A Gift, uh, which, you know, it's kind of a weird song now. If you go back to the original version, my brother, who co-founded the band with me, plays violin. And so I've heard it described as kind of weird violin pop. I've heard other people describe it as like a cross between John Lennon and Neil Young, uh, but it's a great song. And, and a lot of people who know us, that would be, that would be a signature song. Uh, and, and for me, you know, I, I hope that when people find us, you know, as somebody who discovers music, you know, there's bands that have been around forever. And then I finally hear a song, I connect with it and I go back and I get their whole catalog, you know, maybe, this album that's out now is not going to be the album that people connect with. But if it is, and they get in there and they explore the catalog, they're going to find there's a whole world in there. And that's really what I hope for. But our whole world, the cornerstone is the song born with a gift and everything else builds off of that. For me, like a worldview point of view. Um, if you could meet your um, musical idol, but you could only ask that person one question. Who would you meet and what question would you ask? So you, you, you're, lim you're limiting it quite a bit, quite a bit. Because what I would really want to do, I would want to do like a listening session. I would want to, I want to sit down, play them one of their songs and say, tell me what I'm hearing. Because there's this magic that happens, right? I know there's only four instruments playing, but it sounds like 10. How did you do that? You know, what, what am I, that's, that's really what I'm curious in is that creative process or a song like, uh, I've been listening, I mentioned it's like the 50th anniversary of the song Lola by the Kinks. And if you listen to that, like, okay, obviously Ray Davies probably wrote it with a, a guitar. How did that electric guitar emerge? How did that bass line, how did they decide to put the percussion here, you know, uh, you know, or you hear a song like Hey Jude by the Beatles. It's like the most perfectly arranged song. Nothing repeats. Every time they come around, something's a little bit different. That That's what I'm curious about. Uh, I would want to pick their brains about. So you, you tell me one question. It's like my one question I, I, is I, tell me how I, you did it. I, I love that answer. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm, I'm going to, without using a student's name, I'm going to give you something that happened today. Uh, which is similar to what you just did um, in my stream classes. Um, I, I gave the kids a sheet of one sheet of paper and 20 centimeters of, of scotch tape and told them they had to build the tallest tower they could out of those two items. I know, right? That was their reaction at first too. Um, one of them built a tower that's 89 centimeters tall. Uh -huh. Yeah. But um, the one kid said to me, he's like, Mr. Damiano, I don't know if this would work, but what if we got our paper wet? And I was like, well, doesn't that make the paper less strong? And he goes, it would, except I'm going to freeze it. Right? <laughs> I was like, yeah. wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, so, that's, that's great. That's great. That, that just, this, this thing seemed to align. I asked a question and you made it better. <laughs> wow, wow. Just like he made made that better. So, um, how about this? This is I call this song this, this song this question the Diesel Beast question. Um, there's a band in Denton, Texas named Diesel Beast, and I'm sure you can guess that the, that that they're an acoustic pop band, right? <laughs> you're you're being ironic, right? I am. <laughs> they they are a classic metal band. Okay. Because right. there was that band over in France that got shot up at the, you know, the, what, what were they called? The Eagles of the death metal. And right. And, and they, they, they were an acoustic. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. So this, this band, they're beasts. Yes. And they're diesel. Yeah. <laughs> so the question I asked them, and 
their answer is the reason I've dubbed it the Diesel Beast question. But the question was, if you could play with any band in the history of the world and choose the, the your favorite venue to do it at, who would you want to play with? Like open for or have open for you, however that would work out. And where where would you want to play that show? Oh, my. Well, you see, I might be bending the rules on this a little bit, but are you familiar with uh, Bob Dylan's Rolling Thunder review? I'm familiar with Bob Dylan. <laughs> okay. Well, at a certain point in the 70s, when I guess when he just decided that he started out as an itinerant musician and he was back and he was going to be on the road and he was going to go on the road with kind of like a circus, you know, uh, he was going to. So and anybody who had any kind of musical connection to Bob Dylan was invited to be on the tour. And I think the tour might have gone on for a year or so. And so people would come and go. But so Bob Dylan would have his spotlight moment. And then, you know, Roger McGuinn and Joan Baez, uh, different artists who had a, you know, I think R Ringo Starr was there for a little while. But anybody who had any kind of Dylan connection personally or musically was part of that. And like, man, that would have been a scene to be around. I mean, poets like Allen Ginsberg and Gregory Corso, uh, Mick Ronson from the David Bowie and the Spider from Mars, people like that. Uh, and and that's be like, okay, man, I, you know, I, I don't know if I could hang with Dylan and everything, but I have a couple of songs that get cut. You know, I could have a couple of songs I could hang with Dylan on, I could hang with anybody on. And uh, they're not all musical virtuosos, although his basic house band. Those are guys who are like virtuoso, so they could play anything with anybody. You know, like uh, G.E. Smith from the old Saturday Night Live uh, band, you know, who played with Dylan for a long time. You know, he could play lead guitar for anybody in any style. You know, he had his preferred music, but he, he could play. So, you know, I feel like, oh, man, with a band like that, I could jump out there. I could throw out. I could play Born with a Gift, and they would know exactly what to do. Uh, did I cheat? Was, was I, did I cheat with that one? Um, the only thing you you missed was telling me where you would do it. <laughs> where I would do it. Wow. And, but and it it has to still exist, or can I go back in time? You can go back in time. Okay. When I give you the diesel beast question, you'll understand. <laughs> I'll, well, I'll pass her off with this one. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, if I could go back in time, man, I, I'd I'd go to Max's Kansas City in new york city the you know the classic you know ha us being pittsburghers we, we have some connection to andy warhol my dad i do believe grew up in the same neighborhood as andy warhol and was the same age probably stole his lunch money <laughs> so uh uh you know the nat max's kansas city was a, a hangout for the warhol crew and home you know springsteen played there patty smith played there you know it was like a home base for for the Velvet Underground, so yeah, man, I want to play Max's with the uh, Bob Dylan's Rolling Thunder review. All right, so here here was Diesel Beast's answer, so you understand why it's named after them. They want to play at Stonehenge with Dio. Wow, wow! I mean that they were <laughs> they they took that question just like earlier you took that question of mine and you and you made it better i asked that and that was their answer and i was like okay <laughs> yeah and then yeah, i responded that's... well maybe that's what stonehenge is there for maybe it's there to bring dio back <laughs> yeah that's that's probably they've been they've been play you know plaguing themselves trying to find find it and the, and the answer has been right under the nose all this time um, but it was prophetic when they built it. That was prophetic because they knew the Dio was coming. Yes. You know? <laughs> so D Dio was the fulfillment of a prophecy and Stonehenge was made to bring him back. You know, <laughs> it's, it's very deep and complicated. I, I hope they write a song about it. <laughs> In fact, I might message them and suggest it. <laughs> I, I have one, one more question for you. This will probably be, hopefully be the easiest one for you. It's kind of a two-parter though. Um, where can people find you online? Because of course, ultimately we want to get you some, some more fans and what's up next for the little wretches. Oh, well, online, you know, just go to our website, little wretches.com. 
and you know i got a facebook page and everybody <laughs> knows i'm supposed to do the uh instagram and you know all, all the social media platforms uh if you look for us on spotify you can find us if you look for us on youtube you can find us in fact on youtube back when we were in what would have been considered our heyday there's dozens of hours of live stuff from back before YouTube existed when we had people who followed us around with pretty professional recording equipment because they thought this is worth documenting. This is going to mean something someday. So there's a lot of live footage of us on YouTube, you know, just search the little wretches. Uh, and, you know, I have a Facebook page, but it, it's part of me. You know, Robert Andrew Wagner has a Facebook page for the little wretches, uh, you know, kind of rinky dink. Um, but you know, anybody's looking, we're on, you know, if, if you go to Amazon, go to Apple music, wherever you get your music, but people come on, man, I don't make any money. If you stream a song, download the song, man, download the song. If you, if, if you download a song for 99 cents, I might get 80 cents of it. If you stream the song, I don't get nothing. You know? <laughs> I think it's point, I get, point zero 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 three on Spotify for every play. <laughs> yeah, it's it's, but you know, look, I, I'm that's not what I'm in it for. You know, I'm 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 throwing in my two cents for whoever will appreciate it. I'm gonna play. If if I only get to play to the spiders in the corner of my room, I'm playing to the spiders in the corner of my room. You know, I can't live without this. I have to do this. And uh, next, you know, I really want to come back to live music. You know, you might notice I'm holding my guitar right here. Uh, uh, when I leave, they, they can't see it. Go ahead and hold it up a little. There you go. Martin D35. Uh, Johnny Cash played one of these. Uh, but, you know, so I want to return to live performance. You know, electric guitar, I play a, a Les Paul or a Melody Maker. I'm a Gibson dude through a Fender amp but uh, and Martin Acoustics. But uh, I want to get back to live performance. And, and you know, our, our record right now, I think, is on like 100 stations. And traditionally I would be performing in every town where we're getting airplay. And then maybe some of the local journalists would be giving us a write ups. you know, all those things that kind of go together. And it shows probably 20 or 30 people would be buying CDs, you know, and that makes it self-sustaining. Uh, so that's the way it's supposed to work. I want to get back to live music. And then I have about three albums worth of stuff that I've demoed up but haven't like officially recorded because, you know, this thing that we did undesirables and anarchists, I don't think I can reproduce that. That might be as good as I can get with that approach. So, uh, I, I have a batch of songs that I'm ready to record, but how I approach it, especially with the way weird things are now, I might have to layer it. You know, I might have to, track to a you know i might have to play to a click track and then add it it's not my it's not the way i would prefer to do things but i can't wait man you know this things might never go back to the way they were so i got to deal with the way things are now but as long as i got this thing <laughs> you know and a, and a spare set of strings i'm good to go you know i could go down to the trail and busk for that matter you know, <laughs> i'm gonna play live for whoever will have me uh, see that brings up one more quick question. What? How do you feel about the live streaming that had, has been going on? Well, I hate it. I, I, for one, I don't have the patience. Like when I've tried to watch people's live stream shows, this is horrible. People, forgive me, but you know, I got my laptop here, my phone here, you know, and I'm playing chess and I'm checking emails. You know, I, I you know, it's so different, man. You go to a live show and there's the people watching aspect of it that's that's you know that's part of the whole thing and uh that that kind of everybody says ooh all at the same time or everybody starts to all of a sudden the fire catches you know and the spirit goes through the room uh that does not happen in these streaming no. things uh I live right across the creek. You know, I live, you should see where I live. Bald eagles fly by, foxes crawl through my yard. I live right across the creek from the site of the Philadelphia Folk Festival. But they punked out and they went virtual, you know, digital. You could buy a, a ticket and watch their concerts virtually. And, you know, the great people like Richard Thompson, uh, 
It's like, oh, come on, man. I, you know, this is watching TV. I'm not, I'm not here to watch TV. I, I've been to live shows. There's magic there. There is not magic in these virtual things. Now, if we were working with filmmakers, if it was some kind of multimedia production where real visual artists and real sound artists were somehow collaborating, maybe we could make something exciting happen. Uh, but this is not for me. I, I, I watched a lot of it because I missed the, the live um, shows, but you're right. It, it's definitely not the same. Although a, a lot of the ones I was that I would watch are bands that like I know personally. So there was still that attachment for me, which was, you know, that, that was almost enough. Like, you know, yes, this isn't what I want, but no. I'm still getting to see Billy Postal from Doppler effect play. You know, so yeah, you, well, look, man, you got to get it. You got to get it. It's a, you know, the, if, I, if, I you're not, if you're not familiar with Doppler effects, you should check them out. They are a Southern rock, it's almost walking the line of country. Um, they covered Johnny Cash's ring of fire in one of their albums. Um, that it's effect with an A though. It's not the okay, scientific okay. term. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, fact, I've, I've heard the name. I've seen the name. I've read the name, but I don't think I've actually listened to them. Yeah, they're not only are they a great band, but they're they're a great bunch of guys. And I, I'm not going to tell that story on the air again. But that they they earned that from me. <laughs> wow. Um, wow. Uh, but um, so um, we're we're going to cut it short because they did mention I have a meeting. I apologize. Um, this has been episode number. 546 of the Pennsylvania Rock Show. Tonight we featured um, <laughs> sorry, uh, Robert Andrew Wagner of the Little Wretches. Um, and what I'm going to ask you guys to do is go check him out at littlewretches.com and uh, make sure you check us out each and every Friday at buildtoscene.com or parockshow.com and uh, you can hear the, the episode on all these streaming uh, stations that I mentioned, and also 107.1 FM St. Louis, Missouri on Sundays. Um, so we're going to ride off into the distance, play a little bit more of the best unsigned rock that Pennsylvania has to offer, and metal. I sometimes forget that I added that. Um, <laughs> and uh, when you hear John, the American Hilljack Lane, you'll know that the show is ended. My name is Bill. This has been episode 445-46 of the Pennsylvania Rock Show. We'll catch you next time. <laughs>